The Zen philosopher Basho once wrote, A flute with no holes is not a flute. A donut with no hole is a Danish. Or was it Lou Diamond who said that? Who the heck can remember? Would you like to learn from those that are taking their lives, their businesses, and their passions to the next level? Best-selling author of Speak Easy and master connector Lou Diamond is here to connect you to some of the most inspiring and amazing people on this planet. Get ready to thrive loud with Lou Diamond. Welcome, everyone, to another spectacular episode of Thrive Loud with Lou Diamond, connecting you to the most inspiring and amazing people that are thriving each and every day. I'm your host, Lou Diamond. Today on Thrive Loud, we have a man with intimate knowledge of franchise systems, years of interaction with franchise candidates before and after they open for business, and personal experience investing in franchise assets. Along with his wonderful wife, this gentleman has a true understanding of what works and what doesn't in franchising. His business, Fran Choice, helps you find your freedom, control your future, fuel your vision through franchise ownership. Five Lab listeners, uh, we're, we're, can you imagine what we're going to talk about today? Here we are with David Weaver. David, how are you today? I'm great, Lou. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to have you here for so many reasons, which we're going to dive into in our conversations, uh, mostly because I just kind of drove through a town recently at an event I was at, and it was one of those strip towns where there was probably every single franchise fast food place you could ever go to. And then I went to a conference where uh, basically every single franchise brand was there. So I felt like I was in franchise heaven, if you would. So this is going to be relevant to some of the conversations I'm going to have. Dave, what I want to do is rewind a little bit. I, I don't want to go all the way to the womb. I want to go to the point where kind of this thing that you're focused on now became your gig. Great question. So um, franchising kind of came into my world when I, I was hired on by a finance company, a non-bank lender. Um, this was in mid-2000. Uh, specifically hired me because the owner of that bank wanted to penetrate the franchise space in a non-SBA lending capacity, um, which is a bit unique. And, and what drove that was um, Quiznos had rolled out a POS system. So even in 2005, three, four, five timeframe, they were moving from sort of paper accounting to actual accounting through POS systems. So uh, most of that kind of happened in the 90s. Uh, long story short, they, they um, rolled out, you know, required all their franchisees to purchase uh, or lease a POS system. And they had their own book of leases and they didn't know how to do the taxing and, and whatnot. The, most people don't realize that's details. It doesn't matter. So the taxing and leasing scenarios is a, is a challenge. So we purchased um, this company purchased the lease portfolio and got the idea. We should penetrate the franchise space. Um, they were not executing that strategy very well. I had just come off of working in the family business and turning around a manufacturing facility, made um, robotics parts for the, the auto industry. Um, that was a major challenge. I call that my real life MBA. Um, my thought was, I want to live in Colorado again. And how hard can lending money to small businesses be? <laughs> and so I took on the challenge, right? Okay. Uh, what I learned was a lot about how banks look at small business lending, which was super fun. Um, and I learned a ton about franchise brands. And, and ultimately what I started focusing on is what makes some franchises create really happy franchisees with great reviews and, and a wonderful success track record. And why do some franchise brands have a bunch of lawsuits and mad franchisees, right? Hmm. And so I really started honing in on that difference and and also from a financial perspective and so um fast forward to the financial meltdown of 2009 
we were out of the franchise lending space just because the banking situation was what it was. And ultimately, I found myself in a situation where I was sort of, um, I wasn't going to continue doing what I was doing, right? I, 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 I got to the point in my career where I really reflected on why am I working for somebody else anymore? And so I just, that was my sort of push out of corporate America into my own gig. Um, so in 2009, 2010, I, I was looking at bank owned assets. I was looking at how do I get, get into private equity and buy a, a bigger company? What is, um, you know, what does angel investing look like? Um, so I did a ton of research. I underwrote uh, 19 businesses to buy for myself during uh-huh. like the worst time to borrow money. And I mean, it was the worst. And so I learned a ton about that. Um, ultimately, by the end of 2010, I bought a bar on DU's campus, Denver University's campus, with a guy that was in the food business. And so he understood restaurants, and I kind of understood financing a little bit better than he did. So that sounded like a good idea. Um, we owned that bar for a total of 45 days before I pulled out and thought this is a terrible idea. So <laughs> there's that. You, you Sometimes you win and sometimes you learn, right? Um, so at the same time, I started my franchise business, helping people evaluate franchise brands, because that was basically what I'd been doing for years. And um, franchise was a massive success and a ton of fun, and I'm still doing it today. Um, and the bar was a good idea that turned out to be a bad idea. So oh, perfect. And, and, and a complete picture here. And I like this. I want to talk about this area that you dove into. And obviously, look, you had an expertise in how people fund and finance or get into this space, but let's talk about the people getting into this space. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, franchise ownership is a is a huge industry field because we're not just talking obviously about fast foods and whatnot. There, there are numerous franchises out there. Let, let's just double click down on something here. So we understand and we're gonna connect the dots here. David, can you kind of describe who are the people that look to get into franchise ownership? It's a good question. Um, I would say 70% of the people that I'm working with are seasoned corporate executives that understand business. They typically manage people, they manage teams, um, they have P&L responsibility, and they really are at a point in their career where they don't need to ask for permission anymore. They're, 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 they feel like um, I know what I'm doing and I should just go ahead and do this. Um, a lot of these senior executives find themselves in a position where they have executed very well in their job. They, they've overachieved. And then the company has a merger and acquisition um, or they are the, the they are the acquisee um, in in that scenario, and new management comes in, and all of a sudden they find themselves on the sidelines, and they're looking at themselves like I just kicked butt last year, and now I don't have a job. This is ridiculous, right? So they have this sort of I'm not going to do that again. What else should I do? Um, and franchising looks like a, a nice alternative career path. Um, and, and so there's, there's lots of variation in there, but the individual is thinking to myself or to themselves, um, there's gotta be a better way. There's gotta be a different way. Um, or that a lot of people are sort of in retirement and, or, or planning for retirement and they're looking for retirement income. I want to take my foot off the gas and not work 80 hours a week. So what, what can I do to have some sort of income and also keep myself active, right? I'm too young to retire uh, or, you know, too, too old to, to work and too old, too young to retire. So that's uh, about 70 to 80% of my folks, 20 to 30% of the people that I like to work with are successful entrepreneurs that are looking for what's next, right? They, they've got mm-hmm. business number one going, franchising can be appealing to them because they understand how long it takes to build a real system where the business isn't reliant on them. Yep. And so franchising, they can kind of do, they can diversify business assets through franchising because they already know um, what to do and how to do it. 
first of all, and thank you for that great description here. And and whether you knew it or not, there might have been a Freudian slip in there too, which is similar to the 70% of your clients that you're working with fell into a similar spot. You had, had worked for other people. You need you felt a need to try something new. And this is a good bridge into doing some entrepreneurship. And, and it's also a good diversification from an investment point of view, which is a great description of understanding this. I, I want to now figure this out, right? Helping to take people and match them to the type of franchise ownership you can deal with. I want to share this. I shared this with you before we hit record. I just recently went to a trade show and conference where it was like a franchise festival and like, you know, opening a diner menu or going into something that big can be absolutely overwhelming. How do you help match the individuals looking for franchise investment and ownership opportunities with a franchise that fits them, their lifestyle, or maybe even the geography on where they are? So it's it's a it's a, a very elongated educational process and and defined process that I help people uncover um, what brand is a good brand or what business model is a good business model. And so um, I often tell my candidates I'm working with, um, my goal is to help create an educated buyer. I want to I want you to know exactly what you're getting into before you spend any money. Um, so the direct answer to your question is, um, well, but most people don't realize to your to your franchise festival comment, there are 4,000 franchise brand selling franchises in the United States, right? Mm. Um, I have relationships with over 200 different brands. So not everything under the sun, but a lot of variety. Um, some franchise brands are fabulous and deliver tons of value to their franchisees. And some of them are just don't, they're just not that great, right? But how would you know the difference if you're talking to a great sales guy. And so my approach is to help people look at the franchise industry like a business investor so that we're not shopping for a franchise like a consumer, right? Mm -hmm. um, franchising, just like we, we just mapped out, there is way more than food and fitness, right? That's what a lot of people think about because that's what they see when they go to the grocery store. That's where they're, they're consuming franchise brands, et cetera. Um, so an investor will focus on the business model that I'm investing in and or what are the business characteristics that I want in the business I'm going to invest in. So we have a conversation around what does that look like, right? Um, and we dig deep into, you know, it, things like bu business budget, expectations for inputs and outputs. So if I put this much money into a business, how much can I expect to get out? So I, I just try to feel out where is the candidate? What are they trying to do? And, and is that realistic? Right. And yeah. so I, I, in my consulting practice, I'm trying to bring a lot of realism to this idea of following the dream of business ownership, right? Because um, many of us have this dream of business ownership, but, but let's ground that with some sort of foundation. So the foundation is business model first. Um, then I want to focus on the role of the owner. Right. So yeah. how do you want to be the owner of the business? Many people don't realize this, but different franchise brands are built for different kinds of ownership. You've got the owner operator, the guy that's going to the man in the van. This person, there are a lot of great franchises for that particular investor. Um, they don't want to have employees. They just want freedom and flexibility of their schedule. They want to be an expert. They want to do whatever the, the widget thing is. Um, and then on the other hand of the on the other end of the spectrum, you've got the semi absentee manager run business model where the owner doesn't plan on being in the store. They're not going to own one subway. They're going they're planning on owning fifteen subways. Right. And so that franchisor looks different, right? That there are franchise brands that are built for that executive level owner, and and that tends to be the the candidate that that I work with the most frequently. Um, and, and there's a couple of things in the middle. So yeah. I help people identify where do they see themselves fitting in the owner's role. And the last thing I want people to focus on is scale, right? Do you see yourself owning one or two stores 
Or do you see yourself owning five or 10 stores? Or maybe I want to own three Orange Theory Fitnesses and three yoga studios and three massage envies or whatever, right? So um, why would that make sense? Because we're diversifying, but our core customer base is the same, right? Interesting. That same consumer is spending money on multiple places. Um, so, and yes. So, so fascinating and also challenging. And this is where I was going to get at here. Um, let's flip this around, right? There are franchises that are more mature, have been out for many, many years in the franchise model. I, we had a guest recently on the show of a new brand that just came out, and there's new franchisees coming into this. Uh, there, Obviously, risk profiles, and that's the next part I wanted to get to here, is how do you match those things up, right? Because there could be incredible investment opportunities, and I'm thinking about the 20, 30% of your customers who are more entrepreneurial that might be more akin to looking at newer franchises versus more established and well, uh, more familiarized brands that are out there. Help me understand the juggling act between that because that is always evolving. That's a really good distinction and something that I talk about in my consultation because that, that matters, right? So on one hand, we have established brands um, established brands are great because the system is pretty mature. They've evolved. If the franchise was good, they've evolved that system over time and, and they've got their business model system of doing that business um, pretty honed in. Um, they tend to have pretty corporate senior executive teams. So the, the organization is very corporate. So I, I like to point that out to folks. If you're walking away from corporate and all of that corporate politics, a mature brand might not be something that you love just right. because of that interaction is going to feel very similar to what you just left. Uh, the biggest determination is location, right? If it's a mature brand, that's positive because the system is solid. That's positive because the marketing and brand recognition is solid. But the biggest determination, in my opinion, for success is similar to real estate, location, location, location all the good locations in your market have already been taken because that's why you have good brand recognition in your marketplace, right? And so just understand the parameters that, that you're facing when you're looking at a mature brand, right? Yeah. On the flip side, emerging brands are super exciting, right? Um, it's, it's fun to be a pioneer, to bring the next hot concept to market, to have great cocktail conversation like yeah i own the next coolest thing right and a lot of people want that um another cool aspect of emerging brands is it's full of a bunch of pioneer minded people and they want this brand to be the next sensation right and so what i love about emerging brands is the peer network and that collaboration amongst the franchisees is really strong right like mm -hmm. hey i tried this does that work so that's super fun um, and I've, and I've been part of that as well. So the downside to an emerging brand is these guys are selling franchises really fast if it's, if it's scaling. And so the franchisor is really busy just trying to sell franchises, get people through training, onboarding, opening stores, really complicated in the beginning. Right. And so the handholding can be complicated or bumpy. I, so the, the scenario that I often share with folks because a lot of the people that I'm working with come out of tech or, you know, they're, they're tech salespeople or they've done startups before. So they're comfortable. They've got that pioneering mindset because they've already worked for a startup, but an emerging brand can feel like a startup, right? Because it's bumpy in the beginning. It's not going to be smooth. As long as you're cool with that and you've got your eyes wide open, there's lots of pros and cons to both, right? So do you want the stable tried and true uh, workhorse, or do you want the the fast pony that's going to come out of the gate super hard? You know, it's a little bit more of a bumpy ride. I, I got a question regarding the geography piece, and this has always fascinated me. To your point that most of the good locations in your neighborhood have already been taken, in today's world, it might not necessarily matter where that geography is. And to your point about the being involved with the franchise, and you don't actually have to be in the stores and managing it, these things could be in different locations. Is that a growing trend that's happening now where more people are looking at other emerging areas or other franchises that are not in the geography that they're most familiar with? That's a good question, Lou. And, and yes and no. There are franchises in arenas that most people don't think about, like business coaching and um, expense reduction and things like that, where 
um, recruiting in various different industry segments. So those are home-based franchises where they don't really have territory um, mapped out and or territory distinction, right? Like we would see with a brick and mortar location like a subway, they're gonna have a very defined territory. This is your geography. This is your, your zone that you're gonna operate in. Um, so there are there is that right i want to work virtually and all this that a lot of that's going on right now with the great resignation and people having to go back to work and they're like yeah but i kind of like working at home and this is working out for me much better and i don't have to commute and all that so there is that um i think the 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 good in between is a service based company which a lot of people don't think about right so right. We, we think about food and fitness and brick and mortar and that that's franchising. But when you open up the idea, and this kind of comes to the scalability piece, because a service-based business scales much differently than a brick and mortar business. You don't have to open five locations. You just grow your revenue and your employee base and, and, and grow your marketplace in a service-based business. So what does that look like? It looks like the non-sexy roofing, painting, yeah. plumbing, electrical, right? So right. that business is going to scale to your team and trucks and vans and things like that. Um, on the surface, doesn't look super sexy, but I can tell you, um, scale is fun. Um, what I love about service-based businesses is the idea that you can buy a warehouse and own the real estate and have your company pay yourself rent as you're building and scaling the business. So you start off in a rental situation, then maybe you build the business up. Now you're in a position where you can buy the warehouse, rent part of it out. Like, so I call that stacking and yeah. the franchise is the first business, but where do we want to take the second, third and fourth business, right? So yeah. um, service-based businesses are much easier to stack than say brick and mortar businesses that I just gave the example of owning multiple different modalities in the fitness and or services sector. I, I say this all the time. We always need a roof. We always need a gardener. We always need an exterminator. <laughs> These are those that they're not very sexy, but they are definitely uh, good ones to work with. Uh, I, I'm going to dive into you a little bit here, David, because I'm kind of interested. First of all, along this journey and your own personal thing, was there temptation for you to get involved in some of the franchises that you've seen personally? <laughs> Um, I'm laughing because it is a chronic temptation and and something that that I feel like everybody that's in my role in, in the franchise consulting world, um, most of my peers invest in franchises as my wife and I do. And so, yes, I'm constantly evaluating brands, which is actually good because I, I, I my whole style is experience share. So I'm evaluating franchises for me to invest in. And, you know, all the time. And, and so I'm, my, my consulting practice is really helping people evaluate franchise brands. So what are the good questions to ask? And what are, what are the things that you want to be paying attention to? Um, I'm practicing what I preach and, and that's, you know, that holds me with an integrity for myself. Um, but it's kind of a distraction, right? I mean, let's be honest, running an operating business is much different than running a consulting practice and, and that's part of the reason that I enjoy doing that because it exercises a different part of my brain and et cetera. Um, but it's a pretty heavy temptation. It's really interesting because you've also picked something really important here. Um, to your point that most people, they didn't come from family-owned franchise businesses and they didn't come from always being in a franchise. That's, that's the anomaly. Most people are entering the space new and therefore they need guidance, understanding, planning, get a get a, a landscape of what this looks like, which is why franchise is such a smart idea because you're providing a service to so many different people and helping to do this, which now brings me a fun question. Is franchise eventually gonna be a franchise? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a great question. Um, Franchise is actually not a franchise. It's a license agreement. So there are franchise consultants across the country. Um, our competitors are franchises. So there are other consulting groups out there that help people identify franchises. Um, those are franchises and they do have that territory uh, requirement that is very common in, in franchise scenarios. So Franchise is not a franchise that they, they opted early on to be a license agreement. There's differences there 
Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that people have about that, but I won't go into it. Um, we don't have any limitations in a license agreement. So I work with people all over the country. Um, I have worked a couple of international deals back in the a uh, couple years ago. Um, so Canada, United States uh, is sort of my, my wheelhouse and uh, it's a ton of fun to work with folks. So, so you love this, and I love hearing entrepreneurs on the show who are obviously dealing with lots of different new entrepreneurs, which is fun. Be, and kudos to you, since the financial crisis, this is where you've been focused and you've been thriving on most days. David, we all have those days when, when we're not quite kicking on all cylinders and we're a little off our game. David Weaver, when you personally have trouble thriving, what practice do you seek or maybe which individual do you seek out to get yourself back on the thriving track? That's a great question. And I love the tie-in. So for me personally, I'm, I'm a Colorado guy. I'm, I love the mountains. I ski a lot, mountain bike, do all of that. So my happy place is deep in the woods. Um, and as we empty nested last year, the kids all went off to school and the military. So we moved from Denver to the mountains. Um, I live, I've, I've got my playground right outside. Um, so that's where I go to decompress and sort of reset my mindset, which is something that I talk to my candidates a lot about. Understanding the entrepreneurial mindset is quite different than, say, the employee mindset in lots of different ways. Um, and, and as entrepreneurs, we need resets sometimes because you can. it's easy to get it into your head and that kind of thing. Um, and so I have um, a handful of trusted advisors, peers, um, that I call. So yeah. we, I've got an accountability group that meets once a month. Um, I've got certain individuals within Franchise choice organization and outside that I pick up the phone and, and, you know, download, this is what's going on. And, and, you know, I think every entrepreneur needs somebody to say, you know, get over yourself and get back to work kind of thing. Cause that's sometimes what happens. I like it. Question. Let's do the admin part of the show, David. Um, uh, Share with the listeners all the places people can learn about you, franchise, websites, URLs, social handers, where they can look to find you best places. We'll put it in the show notes, but it gets more engagement when they hear it from you. Excellent. Uh, www.franchiseyourfreedom.com is my website. All of my links to social is there. The easiest way to get a hold of me is send me an email. Uh, dweaver at franchise.com is my email address. Um, Go to my website for all of my contact. Uh, I have a franchise webpage as well, um, but franchiseyourfreedom.com is the is the webpage to gather lots of information, good resources, um, content, etc. David Weaver, we've been having fun from the very beginning, but do you want to go down Fun Street with me here on Thrive Loud? I love Fun Street, as we as we, which we all do. We all love having a lot of fun here. Uh, share with the listeners what you shared with me. Is your all-time favorite movie? <laughs> I think there. Is, it, it, this is an easy one. It's Caddyshack. I mean, Bill Murray and Caddyshack is. I think that was my favorite movie when I was twelve, and it's still my favorite movie. <laughs> Listeners need to know he actually responded, "Caddyshack, of course." Like you know, <laughs> of course it is. Um, it, what I always joke about with that movie uh, is is this the infamous scene uh, where. Ty Webb, played by Chevy Chase, is nervous because he's playing the next day and he's doing night golf and he ends up hitting a ball into Bill Murray's crazy shack that he lives in with all the crazy stuff. And what's so great about that scene is that scene was added afterwards, it was not in the original script because they realized they did not have a scene with Chevy Chase and Bill Murray together. And the entire thing is improvised. It's absolutely yeah. insane. So uh, it's some it's some of my favorite humor. Every time they get to that scene and uh, he's you know you see all the the explosive animals that he's got shaped up and uh, I'm looking I'm looking to finish the place. It's just really good. This place is a real shit hole. Is when he says that it's just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> the pond, the pool, or the pond. The pond would the be pool. good for you. Exactly, the pond would be good for you. Uh, we're gonna do the speed round here, David. What I want you to do is I'm gonna ask you something. I want, it's the first thing that comes to your mind, things that lift you up, motivate you. Basically, they make you feel good and make you thrive. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. Of late, a song that maybe you love to hear or one that pumps you up. Mm, a song that pumps me up. Um, it, 
To be honest with you, I've been listening to Metallica again for the long, it's from a long, long time ago. We used to listen to that high school football. And uh, I find myself pulling that onto my, um, you know, my iTunes more frequently than not to get a little like energy it. going. Favorite food that is not a dessert? Uh, I would say one in the same. I, I'm not a dessert guy, so I'm not, I'm not chocolate cake kind of. My dessert is fruit. And, okay. and so, you know, blueberries and raspberries and strawberries are kind of my, my deal. He's a berry kind of guy. I'm berry guy. A an activity you wish you did more of? Depending on the season, but um, hiking, mountain biking, skiing. So awesome. and anything outside. An activity you wish you did less of? Sitting in a chair. <laughs> if I could snap my fingers, David Weaver, and you could be anywhere in the world, where are you? Here, Colorado or Canada. I like it. In the moment where you are. Uh, two more questions here. Uh, one, I have the privilege of seeing behind David, and I see um, you, you mentioned that you're, you have children in the military. Uh, where are they at, at school or, or university or, or at academy, I guess, at this point? So I've got, I've got three kids, um, blended family, two of mine and, and one of my wife. So um, my oldest daughter is at Baylor um, down in Waco, Texas, studying to be uh, studying medicine, uh, beginning her sophomore year. My son, my oldest is um, a Marine. So that's what's behind yeah. me. Um, interesting. We don't come from a, a military family. So he came to me um, middle way through high school. And I was kind of, you know, trying to get him on track. He was a little bit off track and, you know, hit sophomore, junior year, like you got to get, this is your A time because by the time you become a senior, like your, your resume or, or your, um, you know, your school grades need to be where they need to be if you're going to go to school. And he just was like, dad, I don't know if I want to go to college. I I'm, mm -hmm. I'm afraid I'm just going to waste your money and, and sitting in class all day is something I don't want to do. And I was like, all right, that was a bit of a shock. Um, what are you going to do? Because you're not going to be in my basement. We're not going to do that whole like, you know, <laughs> stay in the parents house until you're 30 thing. So what's the plan? And he was like, I think I want to be a Marine. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I kind of, you know, took that with a grain of salt and, and sort of kept asking questions. And sophomore year, junior year, he, he got more solidified, more solidified. So He's uh, he's 20 as well, and he's in Japan for the next 36 months. Awesome. Amazing. And, and we thank him for his service. And service is something that you've been all about. Two more questions here. One is, and they're both related. We're going to wrap this show up on a bow and a franchise piece. One, the franchise organization you like working with the most, meaning like as you're bringing people in, the one that's the most user-friendly, if you want to share that name, hopefully we're not, we don't want to flip the ones that are the worst. And the other one is as a, well, answer that question first. Um, so I'm a systems guy. I came out of manufacturing that my dad owned a foundry, et cetera. Um, and so I like the brand. I like to work with the brands that have very um, standard system or process to follow. I think it's easier for the candidate and it's also um, that's in my mind, that's kind of what, what you're getting with a franchise. Right. So, um, I have probably five favorites, so I'm not going to name them, but I would say, um, the, the one that your listeners would recognize is, uh, exponential fitness. They have 10 mm -hmm. different brands under the exponential family. It's a fitness orientated, um, family of brands, um, They've got really, really good systems and processes and their sales team is remarkable and really buttoned up. So I'll, I'll give them a plug. And uh, my last question here has to do with uh, when we think of franchises, most often we think about fast food franchises. You look like a pretty healthy guy that doesn't eat any of that. But if there was a franchise place that you would go to that you would say, because, hey, they're pretty good. I've actually helped connect with some people in those franchises. Any of those in, on the list? Uh, I would say I'm a Colorado guy again. So my, the food that I could eat every single day is Chipotle. I mean, I, uh, I never okay. get sick of Chipotle. Um, now I don't, I don't work with Chipotle professionally or have them in my inventory. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of the burrito scenario. 
Gotcha. Just don't have a burrito every day, David. That probably would be a little. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not good for the waistline, but uh, really it sure does taste good. David Weaver. Check him out, everybody. He is at Fran Choice. All the links will be in the show notes. Hey, David, thank you so much for coming on Travel Out today. Thank you, Lou. This has been a blast. You're fun to talk with. <laughs> thank you. And to all our listeners out there, thank you for joining us. And until next time, keep moving on, and upward. And remember, be brief, be bright, be gone. To never, never land. You've been listening to Thrive Loud with your host, Lou Diamond. Check us out on the web at thriveloud.com and follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook at Thrive Loud. And check us out on the Good Pods app at Thrive Loud, where you can follow, listen, and connect directly to Lou and all of the Thrive Loud episodes. Thanks for listening.